so next we'll be hearing from Shai Bussar. Uh, he's executive director of the renowned Bill of Rights Defense Committee. Uh, he supports populist constitutionalism as a civil rights lawyer, an independent columnist, community organizer, and as a hip-hop and electronica MC. So as you can guess, he brings a lot of creativity and energy to what seems to me like a tireless, perpetual round of travel around the country, uh, helping organize local civil liberties groups like ours. I think uh, Shahid's going to discuss some of the connections between Islamophobia and uh, surveillance uh, state issues that concern many of us. So, Shai. Thanks, Shai. Very kind. I want to start off just with, uh, I, I kind of hate when people do this to start thanking people, but I think it's really important in this case because it is very important principally that each of you are here. So I really just want to thank each of you for being in the room on Saturday morning to talk about what can be a very uncomfortable issue. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this event, um, uh, Thomas and Kit and Martine and Sue. Uh, and, I, and I really want to thank also Jamie and, and, and Stockham, especially these people who have uh, held, uh, and, and are in James case, holding elected office, um, taking their public platforms and planting a flag on issues that really do go to the core of what our society is about. And it's another reason why you're important here, is not only to hear about the issues and to educate yourselves, but also to hear who your representatives are who give a damn about these issues. And another issue that I really want to focus on is the opportunity to build community among yourselves. I would just invite you, you know, we're privileged as the speakers to look out at you guys and see all of you, but I'd invite you to look around because you're not going to find a more diverse group in one room anywhere in the next, you know, year. You know, I mean, it, it is a shocking rainbow of people in this room, and then there's a great deal of power in that. Um, and so, if there's any context to my remarks, you know, we invited uh, Fred Grandy, a representative, to come, and so some of the debate character might be lost. But uh, I'm both interested and also a little bit terrified to have a chance to create some, or introduce some intellectual tension with Jamie in particular, because I think we have the same perspective with respect to the subject matter. But on the method, I think I take a very different view, which is to say, we do have the facts. And if law meant anything in this country, we would have that too. But we don't live in a country governed by the rule of law anymore. And so that's the context of my remarks, is that there's a theme here. We're gonna talk a little bit about how much the Constitution has suffered in the last decade, and the extent to which freedoms that we have long taken for granted in this country, quite frankly, no longer exist. And I'm not talking now about hypothetical future fears of sliding down a slippery slope. I am talking about what has already happened, right? So if there, you know, people often hear this catchphrase about the Bill of Rights, we have to use them or lose them. We didn't use them and we have lost them. And so the question is, if we as a society will band together and we the people can get them back. And that is the question before us, I think, that goes beyond merely the vilification of the particular minority du jour, right? Muslims are uh, a whipping post, to borrow a, a, a phrase that Jamie used earlier. Uh, and there are other whipping posts. Think about Latinos and the, the vitriol around the immigration debate. Uh, I'm gonna invite you in a little bit when I start talking about the FBI to think about peace activists or environmental activists who have long been criminalized for free speech, even before 9-11. More in the case of the environmentalists and the peace activists, but, and finally, I want to leave you uh, just you know, to, to offer some counterpoint to the doom and gloom, which you will hear in most of my remarks. There are solutions. And I just want to point out that they really start with exactly what you are doing right now, coming together, particularly across communities, to hear about issues of common concern. This is how everything that has ever happened that is positive in this country has happened, has come from that, right? The abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, the, the, the labor movement that got us all the weekend and social security and workers comp, right? Those were won through organizing. Those, those were won through people like Elizabeth raising her voice, right? And, and, and doing what the youth leaders in particular are doing, and I think showing the rest of us the way. So to the older folks in the crowd who might be used to yelling at our televisions, I just say take some hope in the activism and, and the energy coming out of the youth these days. This is a real opportunity for us to make a difference and we respond to the opportunities. All right, so let's start with the rule of law. Yesterday there was a case in Southern California that ruled that 11 Muslim students were guilty of committing free speech. 
And so now they basically have sentences. Uh, and they're not vicious sentences, but they amount to years of probation. There was a student group, a Muslim student association, that was basically uh, disbanded for a year by the university, and their crime was speaking. And it's particularly interesting because the same act in other settings, this in particular was a series of interruptions of an Israeli ambassador who was speaking at UC Irvine, the same facts in any other community uh, you know, would, would, would be perfectly legal. I feel a little bit odd saying this in this room, and I'll follow me here. This will seem like a digression, but it'll make sense in a minute. There is, uh, in your midst, a, um, can I call you out, Ray, do you mind? <laughs> Ray McGovern in the back is the founder of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. He is a uh, career former. Um, <laughs> Ray is the best kind of CIA agent, which is the one, like the kind, basically, who <laughs> talks a lot about executive crimes and concerns and the need to restore the rule of law. Ray silently stood up and turned his back on Hillary Clinton when she gave a speech at GW when he was dragged outside and beaten. So the point I want to make here is that while Muslim free speech is formally criminal, and I can go into a litany of Supreme Court cases and statutory sort of lines, the Humanitarian Law Project case and the Material Support Standard and the Patriot Act in particular that have made it so, uh, while Muslim free speech is being criminalized, it, it's actually an equal opportunity offense, right? It's not just us. And that's a theme I want you to take away too, right? All of this stuff you hear about Islamophobia, and the, you know, it's not just geared at targeting Muslims and beating a whipping post. It also degrades our civilization because it creates an opportunity for another group to be put in the same position. The degradation of rights for some community portend the degradation for rights for other communities. When Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, it wasn't just an abstract principle, right? That's an operable, uh, an operative observation of what happens. And, and, and you, could others, you could also see this in Pastor Niemöller's reflections on first, they came for the, the communists, and they came for the trade unionists, and then they came for the Jews, and then they came for him. Well, in America, we already went for the environmentalists, and then we came after the Muslims. The Latinos are on the chopping block now, and the peace activists are sort of coming online. And, and that, I'm not even, you know, speaking in hyperbole here, I mean, I, I want to, I feel like I'm uh, getting so animated now, I'm forgetting what everything I wanted to share with you. Another thing that's happened this week that demonstrates the degradation of the rule of law in this country is the uh, execution of Troy Davis, who many of you might have heard about. So how is it that in a society that essentially meets out the ultimate, most grave punishment exclusively for all intents and purposes to one race, largely exclusively for crimes against another, uh, there is you know, obvious statistical disparities in the racial application of the death penalty, and there are many compelling reasons to believe in this person's actual innocence. How is it that we kill people who very well could be innocent? when we know that the system that sentenced them in the first place is outright racist on its face, right? We don't live in a system governed by the rule of law. We had a 14th Amendment that has an equal protection clause that says that everyone is, it has a right to equal protection under the laws, but you see what that means. There, there is a right to due process under the law. You know, what, what does that mean when the Supreme Court can rule that if, if defendant, uh, pardon me, if, uh, if plaintiffs in civil lawsuits rely on the instructions of judges and are then kicked out of court when the judges got the instructions wrong, right? There is a, there is a degree of formalism that the right wing in the in the, in the jurisprudence, especially, has attached its to itself to, and has essentially eroded the opportunity for courts to to demonstrate and, and exercise checks and balances. Right? Madison talks in the Federalist Number Ten about the need to create different factions to. Pardon me. We, we approach that. In a democracy, you can't suppress factions, right? So how do you keep factions from destabilizing a republic? You create many of them so that none of them can dominate the rest. It's like crabs in a bucket. And that's what the branches of the federal government were supposed to be. But the independence of the judiciary has been compromised both by the dominance of prosecutors throughout the federal judiciary, and particularly executive branch veterans on the Supreme Court, and the rise of a contrived jurisprudence that quite frankly makes up the rules as they go along. There, there is no law in this country. The last thing I'll say on this before I get to the FBI is that there is a war criminal sitting on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, members of the Bush administration, Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, authorized the use of torture as an interrogation device. 
These acts, the authorization of torture, is criminal under domestic statutory law, our constitutional law, under international law that we fought a world war to establish. Sent a Supreme Court justice to prosecute the case establishing that there is strict liability for human rights violations. If you torture people, it doesn't matter if there's a war going on. It doesn't matter if there's a ticking bomb. It doesn't matter if you've got orders. If you torture people, you are a criminal. And so what did we do in this country? When we did find out some modicum of transparency into a far more vast field of evidence that remains secret, we gave judicial robes to one of the architects of the torture policy. He has a lifetime seat on a federal appellate court one notch below the Supreme Court. It is the last court to which Americans in the western third of the United States can appeal as a matter of right. He has a lifetime appointment drawing a quarter million dollar paycheck of your money. And as much as I agree with you, Jamie, on the sort of you know, complete uh, uh, corruption pervading the Islamophobia, I think the, the, the opportunity for us to rely on the law uh, and the constitutional law, which I totally agree with you and how they, you know, how they fit and what they should say, but I think they mean so little on the ground that we can't take comfort in them anymore. And so I'm going to leave you again when I get to solutions about ways to fix this. I'm probably um, one, two minutes left. The FBI is a rogue agency with a recidivist history that has uh, emerged as America's thought police for decades. Does anybody remember COINTELPRO? Does the word mean anything to anyone in the room? Yeah. For folks who don't, COINTELPRO is a counterintelligence program. For decades, at least 20, possibly 30, depending on how you construe it, and from another perspective, ongoing today, the FBI, along with the CIA and other intelligence agencies, conducted what the US Senate Call. This is not my words, this is the U.S. Senate in 1976, after two years of investigation and 18,000 pages of congressional testimony, revealed much of what it called a, quote, sophisticated vigilante operation aimed squarely at suppressing the legitimate exercise of First Amendment rights of speech and association, end quote. And that was the FBI we're talking about. Okay, so what the FBI does now, after its powers have dramatically expanded in the last 10 years, including under this president, very uncomfortable thing to acknowledge, but I gotta tell you, the FBI is far worse now than it was under George Bush. In a lot of dimensions, and I can explain how, I can give you cases, talk to me after. Um, the FBI's modus operandi is to hire an ex-convict, give them $100,000, send them into a faith community to bribe anyone they can find in a fraud plot, aggrandize the fraud plot over the course of years, turn it into a terror plot that is funded, trained, envisioned, and equipped by the FBI, and then bust it on the eve of execution and run around saying, we're winning the war on terror. Give us more money with the FBI. The director of the FBI was just entrenched, a statutory term extended for the first time since J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was an FBI director who was so powerful that members of Congress and the president could not cross him because the domestic intelligence apparatus was so vicious and so entrenched recreating all of these things under our noses. That as much as I as a Muslim fear, uh, quite frankly, the vilification of our minority, my concern is that as canaries in the social coal mine, we portend a constitutional crisis that is not limited to us. We are watching the United States unravel before our eyes. And so the question is, has DC and the FBI and the rule of law and the federal courts are all off the rails? And you can see what kind of attention Congress is paying to this, right? What is Congress worried about? The latest attempt to shut down the government, right? Our leaders are basically failing. With all due respect to the people among them, I think, who are raising intelligent, credible, laudatory flags like you and others. Uh, our institutions are failing. And so, as are we the people, I guess I'm just going to offer you a set of prescriptions. So the first is to act affirmatively in your towns to restore the rights that the federal government is taking away from you. You have opportunities to do that. Many of the folks who organized this event here, talk to Thomas later, are promoting in Montgomery County uh, a platform to restore civil rights. And one of the things it would do is prevent the kind of ideological profiling that you see apparent, not just in the war on terror vis-a-vis -vis Muslims, but also against the environmentalists and peace activists. It would also address many of the, the concerns and the civil rights issues that other communities encounter with respect to law, local law enforcement, like profiling. Right? The, the, the opportunity, the need at hand is for we the people to reclaim our constitution, and that includes securing the rights that different communities need to be secured in our homes, and our persons, and our workplaces. And if law enforcement agencies abuse some communities in some ways, and other communities in other ways, 
the opportunity we have is to band together and stop all the abuses, which is why I'm so excited, particularly to see all of you here, representing so many different parts of this community in this room together. I'll just leave you with one last thought. I think as much as what we are saying is perhaps helpful uh, and informative, the real value of this event, from my perspective, is for you to meet each other. People in this room, sitting in the chairs who you don't already know, I suspect if you look around, there's probably plenty of them. Don't leave here without meeting somebody new and getting their contact information and having coffee with them. Right? It, it is, we need to stitch together the fabric of our melting pot. You can see my metaphors here. We need to uh, mix together the ingredients in our melting pot to get the soup to like congeal, right? I mean, we live in a big salad down the melting pot, but we see in this room the soup melting. And so I just encourage you to help melt the soup. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we really appreciate your questions.